A local bear attack victim tells his story. Local laws regarding pythons under the microscope. And charges laid in a Mac store robbery. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Well, the Thunder Bay man who escaped a bear attack Saturday morning is telling his ordeal. Trevor Miller was out for a walk with his two dogs at a provincial park in Ignace when they were attacked by a predatory black bear. The two-hour standoff claimed the life of one pet, leaving Miller without one of his best friends. Nate Jones tells his story. Poor Trevor Miller, he didn't even see it coming out for a walk at Sandbar Lake Provincial Park with his dog and his sister's dog, Miller decided to take a break at a picnic table. He was blindsided from behind by a fully grown black bear which knocked him to the ground. Panicking, he attempted to grab the two dogs and wade deep into the nearby lake. My bag was on the shore that he batted around a bit and I had a camera in it. And I, at the first, I thought, I hope he doesn't break my camera. I was like, then I realized, like, you know, this isn't over. This isn't, you know, this is happening. Like, it didn't feel like it was happening. From there, it was about two hours of the bear attempting to attack Miller and the dogs. More than once, it swam out to get him and was turned back after being hit on the nose with a stick that he found. Yelling at the bear with one dog on his shoulder and one under his arm, he did everything he could to deter the animal. After a while, it looked like the bear had left. I ran up to the picnic table and I grabbed the leashes and I ran back to the water and before I was at the water he come out at the picnic table again it was like he was he knew where I had to go and he was just always right behind me or right in front of me and finally they managed to get away and started to run Miller looked behind him and the bear was following armed with a pocket knife and a stick he faced off with the bear twice the third time his sister's dog Spyro stepped up he just walked right up to the bear and the bear, you know, just raised up and just like grabbed him and, and ran. And, and, you know, like my heart just, my heart just uh, sank. Miller and his dog Puzzle made it to a ranger station. It wasn't until he was examined that he realized he had been bit by the bear. Since then, the bear has been captured and euthanized. But Miller has lost one of his best friends forever. He did that for me and I could feel like him telling me now you know to just just run now. Nate Jones, TVT News. Everyone is looking for answers into why two young boys were killed by a python in New Brunswick this weekend. There are rules about exotic pets like large snakes and Thunder Bay has a bylaw prohibiting certain types of constrictors. Meanwhile, a local reptile expert says it's the size and not the species which may be the problem. Cheryl Holmes reports. Thunder Bay has a large list of banned animals. The list includes all snakes from the boa and python families as well as any venomous reptiles. Uh, some of these animals just don't adapt well to captivity. So people acquire these animals without realizing what they're really getting into. Well, there is many snakes, many lizards that are good pet material. Um, when you're getting the bows and pythons, the bigger species, um, there's a lot of safety issues involved. Those safety issues could be anything from possible diseases carried by the snake to improper feeding methods and a lack of education. Camstra says big snakes must be kept in terrariums, not aquariums, as was the case in the New Brunswick tragedy, where two brothers aged four and six were asphyxiated by a python that escaped from a pet store downstairs from an upstairs apartment. Thunder Bay's bylaw allows traveling wildlife shows or other people to keep boas and pythons only for zoo, education and research purposes or with a permit. Generally that rule is, uh, is there because most of those people do require uh, a certain expertise. They have specialized permits and so they are uh, better equipped to handle those types of animals. Reptile Rob says large exotic animals should be owned by herpetologists and others who've studied amphibians their whole lives. Any snake that reaches 10 or 15 feet at adult size is too big for a family home. You can tame them to a degree of handling them, but there's always handling issues. Anything over six feet, 
regardless if it's a corn snake, garter snake, anything, okay? Anything over six feet is guaranteed you got to get another person involved. Reptile Rob says generally the larger species of snakes shouldn't be kept as pets, but if you do want to have a snake as a pet, a smaller guy like this, it's probably a better choice. Cheryl Holmes, TBT News. We'll have more on that tragic New Brunswick case coming up a little later on. Well, after a thorough international search, the Community Economic Development Commission has found its new CEO right here in Thunder Bay. Former Resolute Forest Products General Manager Doug Murray will be stepping into his new role next week. The chair of the CEDC and local politicians welcomed Murray into the position today. The newly appointed CEO says there's a lot of his agenda that needs to be addressed, with mining readiness near the top of the list. He is ensuring Thunder Bay is prepared and ready for spin-off jobs being created. Murray adds it's important to invest in a variety of businesses to keep economic growth stable. Diversification is really important so that we don't have all our eggs in one basket. It doesn't mean that forestry still isn't important because it is. The grain handling business is still important. But we need to grow other parts of the business. You know, healthcare. Look, look at how, how healthcare has expanded. The chair of the CEDC, Pauling Setter, thinks they have the right man for the job because of his engineering education and strong business background. He's got a very strong background in a lot of things that are relevant to us here, in energy, in forestry, in value-added forestry, and he's got a great breadth of knowledge and understanding of our local economy. Murray replaces former CEO Steve Demings, who resigned in the spring. Well, it was an opportunity for northern municipalities to have their voice heard. Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation Glenn Murray was in Murillo today, speaking with officials about issues currently being faced in their communities. As Courtney Rutherford tells us, a new program worth tens of millions of dollars could lead to infrastructure improvements starting as early as this fall. Decisions in the north, about the north, should be made by people in the north. It's all about revitalizing roads, bridges and critical infrastructure in northern municipalities. A budget of $100 million could help small, rural and northern communities take on projects that will help improve transportation of people and products and ultimately create more jobs and a more inclusive place to live. We have been building high quality research facilities here. So it's not just about pipes and pavement, it is about that, but it's also about the education, the law schools, that give northerners more choices and more ability to build a con their economy here and stay here and be able to go to school here. $100 million would be available October 1st of this year. However, the one-year fund could become permanent as part of the 2014 Ontario budget. Local representatives gather here to give feedback and discuss where the money ultimately could be going. MPP Bill Morrow says the upgrades in these municipalities won't be able to be completed on their own. Quite frankly, they can't do it without provincial help. And uh, as the minister has said earlier, it would be really wonderful if the federal government would find some capacity to step up to the plate, especially on the highway issue, uh, and aid the province in what it is we're trying to do. And then we think we could already uh, certainly go a lot farther than we already have. And that is exactly what the mayor of Oliver Papoonge, Lucy Klusterhoos, is dealing with. She says a bridge located on Hearthstone Road needs significant repair. But with a price tag well into the millions, she says they need support in order to get the job done. There are some municipalities, as stated at the uh, beginning of this meeting, do not even have the funds to do an engineering study, which is a requirement to apply for the funding. So we have to look at it from the perspective of all different sized communities. And I hope that happens today. And I hope that's taken back to Toronto. The consultations held in Marilla will help the province build on existing policies and begin to develop an infrastructure program that will respond to the needs of the municipalities. The money will start funding projects beginning this fall. Courtney Rutherford, TBT News. A Thunder Bay man has been arrested and charged in connection with a robbery that occurred at a Mac store Saturday evening. At approximately 9.30, a man entered the store armed with a syringe. Police say he made off the small amount of money and there were no injuries. The suspect did not wear a mask and surveillance cameras provided a clear view of the suspect. City police say a 28-year-old man was arrested yesterday on the sidewalk in the 500 block of East Victoria Avenue. He remains in custody and will appear in court at a later date. Meanwhile, two men are in custody after a, biz a bust rather, at the Drug Enforcement Unit and the Guns and Gangs Unit. 
Search warrants were issued for residences on Strand Avenue and Piccadilly Street following information about a cocaine trafficking operation. Police seized a handgun and $19,000 in cash and a variety of drugs worth about $5,000. The handgun had been reported stolen about four months ago. A 35-year-old man and a 25-year-old man are facing numerous charges. An investigation into watered-down cancer drugs given to patients in Ontario and New Brunswick concludes it was an honest mistake, but it recommends an overhaul of the system to make sure it doesn't happen again. Kim Brunebert reports. She waited so long to do something so simple. I'm feeling pretty good. Kate Warner's chemo for breast cancer ended in June. Finally, her hair is back, but so is the fear. Nobody wants cancer to return and nobody wants to have to go through the treatment again. But we're never sure and we may never, never be sure. She's not sure because her chemo drugs were accidentally watered down. She's one of more than 1,200 affected patients in Ontario and New Brunswick. The chemotherapy bags were mixed by Marchese Hospital Solutions, and they contained more saline solution than the labels showed. And because the company fell in a jurisdictional gray area, neither the Ontario nor the federal government was supervising it. No one should have to go through what the affected patients and their families have gone through. To those patients and their families, I want you to know how deeply sorry I am that you have had to go through this. The Ontario government commissioned a report into the scandal. The pharmacist in charge of the review found the company diluted the drugs by 7 to 10 percent, but said it appeared to be an honest mistake. The problem boiled down to gaps in communication and its unintended consequences. The consequences for the patients, he says, is unknown, but likely not serious. Chief among his recommendations, he says Health Canada should oversee all companies that mix drugs for hospitals. Health Canada says it's working with all the provinces to set up a national plan. And in the fall, the Ontario government says it will introduce legislation that will authorize the province's College of Pharmacists to oversee hospital pharmacies. They should have done that a long time ago. This is a serious offence. You can't play with people's lives like that. Warner says she's disappointed. A report with no blame and no punishment. And for her, still no answers. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Toronto. The Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre and the Health Unit have declared a C. difficile outbreak over. The bacterium can cause mild to severe diarrhea and intestinal conditions like inflammation of the colon. The outbreak was contained to two inpatient surgical floors of the hospital and lasted for three weeks. A total of five cases were confirmed. A shiny new Great Lakes vessel, which is named after our city, is making its maiden voyage. The Thunder Bay is the latest Trillium-class vessel in the Canada Steamship Line's fleet. The ship picked up a load of iron ore pellets in Michigan and stopped today in Port Colborne, Ontario, where CSL officials celebrated its arrival with a formal ceremony. It will now head to the Port of Quebec to be unloaded. The Thunder Bay is one of four new CSL vessels built in China. It uses 15% less fuel than older vessels and also releases fewer emissions. Thunder Bay Port Authority CEO Tim Heaney says he's unsure whether the ship will visit the local port this season, but he says that they're planning a large celebration for whenever the Thunder Bay does make its first stop here. Well, Thunder Bay's favorite family fair is here for another year. The CLE officially opened its doors to the public today, and it looks like it's going to be a great week. Officials are hoping for nice warm weather, as more than 60,000 people are expected to head to the fair over the next five days. It's open every day from noon until midnight, and it offers midway rides, live entertainment, and over a dozen food vendors. Fair chair Ralph Scarf says advanced ticket sales were very high. According to him, there's one thing that keeps people coming back. It's tradition. You know, your grandmother and grandfather brought your mom and dad here and your mom and dad bring you to the fair. I think it's just something everybody looks forward to in the summer. Expect a larger than normal midway this year with four new rides. There has also been an expansion of indoor activities to keep everyone happy at the family fair. Looks like a lot of fun. Well, here's hoping the weather cooperates for them. Unlike yes. last night when the Border Cats mm -hmm. and the Canadian Senior Little League Championships uh, were rained out. Hopefully that won't be the case tonight, Sarah.
Definitely. Right now, it looks like the rain uh, has been holding off for the start of the CLE and the Border Cats. They are underway right now in a doubleheader. So uh, we'll just take a look at the last uh, 24 hours. We can see that rain has held off over the region for the most part. A bit of cloud cover, but not much in terms of precipitation. Maybe some pop-up showers here and there. Today's high, we made it up to 20 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. That rain holding off for most of the day. The winds coming from the north-northwest, gusting up to about 14 kilometers per hour. Across the region right now, still quite cool for this time of year. Those temperatures in the mid to high teens, a bit cooler in Red Lake where they're currently sitting at 12 degrees and Big Trout Lake also at 12. A bit warmer in Greenstone, they're currently sitting at uh, 17 degrees under sun and cloud. Not much in terms of precipitation at the moment. Thunder Bay tonight, clear skies, uh, so not much in terms of rainfall overnight. Dipping down to about 7 degrees, so still cool, but uh, not too chilly. Winds coming from the north and gusting up to about 14 kilometers per hour. Into tomorrow, we can see this cool front that we have been tracking for the last uh, few days is still headed into our area, so there is always the possibility of some pop-up showers, uh, maybe some electrical activity as well. But into the weekend, we can see nice uh, warm temperatures that are expected to head our way. I will have more on that later on in the newscast. Thanks, Sarah. Well, U.S. President Barack Obama has canceled his trip to Russia. We'll have that story and more for you as your Wednesday News Hour continues. They slip back in the Cold War thing and, and a Cold War mentality to wiretap anyway.
Barack Obama has cancelled a personal meeting with Russia's president. The U.S. is seething over Russia's decision to grant asylum to the man who leaked American secrets. And that's not all. Carolyn Dunn reports. Barack Obama. Could there be anything more American than a U.S. president appearing on a late-night TV talk show to make his case in a foreign policy squabble? A harsh rebuke from Jay Leno's couch aimed squarely at Russia. There have been times where they slip back into Cold War thinking and, right. and a Cold War mentality. To wiretap anyone. This man, um, Edward Snowden, is the straw that the broke the camel's back. The former spy agency contractor is charged in the U.S. with treason for allegedly leaking information about secret surveillance programs. In a move they must have known would infuriate the U.S., Russia granted him asylum. Even though we don't have an extradition treaty with them, uh, traditionally we have tried to respect if there's a lawbreaker or an alleged lawbreaker uh, in their country. Uh, we evaluate it uh, and we try to work with them. In retaliation, Obama is pulling out of a summit he and Putin had planned for September. The Snowden issue is just the latest crack in an already uncomfortable, fractured relationship between the two presidents. They've just never clicked. Topping a long list of Obama's grievances are Putin's continued support of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad in the midst of a bloody civil war as well as big divisions on human rights issues, including Russia's new anti-gay propaganda law that has sparked outrage and boycotts around the world. It's important for us to, to send a message uh, that uh, we're not in a, in a place of comfort with where he's headed on a whole list of issues. It's all proof, says the Kremlin, that the U.S. is incapable of developing relations on an equal basis. Still, Russia says the invitation stands. The White House confirms Obama will attend the G20 in St. Petersburg as planned, but he won't be meeting with Putin. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Washington. Preliminary autopsy results are in from the two boys who died in Campbellton, New Brunswick. The police say they show the children died from asphyxiation. Noah and Connor Bart were sleeping at a friend's house when they were found dead with a python next to them. A vigil is planned for this evening. Michael Dick reports on new information about the snake and the shop it was housed in. Now, days later, still questions about what exotic animals are inside and now some insight about how a 45-kilogram snake ended up here. The public likes to believe that Mr. Savoy purchased this animal for his own joy. And uh, I need, I'm here to inform the public that's the furthest thing from the truth. Since daybreak, conservation officers have sat outside the door, but now Mark Doran, who once worked inside the store, said the snake was found and seized illegally from a home, then handed over to Reptile Ocean when it operated as a zoo. As for who brought it... It was the government that said, I don't want that animal in a home, it's got to be in a zoo. He's just not clear what level. For its part, the RCMP says that part of the investigation is still ongoing. And meanwhile, people are remembering four-year-old Noah Barth and his big brother, Connor Barth, just six. In deep grief, a vigil now planned to help all share in the pain. It's expected hundreds will come together to shed tears, try to understand the devastation, and to remember. Vigil tonight will bring the community together. It will be a time uh, for people to uh, really uh, talk about it and celebrate. Celebrate the life of these two kids, you know, Connor and Noah, you know, who, uh, you know, the world now knows who they are. So in this community that's been simply rocked by tragedy, there are still so many lingering questions. Those will have to wait for the days ahead. Right now it's about coming together, helping a family and a community deal with such a devastating loss. Michael Dick, CBC News, Campbellton, New Brunswick. An inquiry into the deadly collapse of a shopping mall last summer is still underway. And today, never-before-seen footage from Elliott Lake offered a glimpse into what shoppers saw that day. Jeff Semple reports. Surveillance video shows the Algo Center Mall moments before it collapsed. People drinking coffee, buying lottery tickets, then running for their lives. The rooftop parking lot caves in, crashing down two stories to the ground floor, prompting dozens of people to call 911. Fire department. The, uh, the roof just collapsed at 
the Algo Center Mall. The Algo Center Mall roof just collapsed? Yes, sir. Uh, from my area, I can't see any more. We're all too afraid to go out there. The dramatic tape was played publicly for the first time at the inquiry into the mall collapse. I wake up in cold sweats with nightmares. They heard testimony from witnesses, including mall employee Adam Amy Yacht. That is the one thing I remember from being in there. For somebody yelling help. I wanted to jump down and go help, but every time I thought about doing that, I thought about my beautiful wife and my newborn son. Today marks the start of the public inquiry's second phase, focusing on the emergency response. Surveillance video shows police arrived just a couple of minutes after the collapse, but the rescue efforts would soon be called off. The structure deemed unsafe to enter, even with two people still trapped inside, including Teresa Perizzolo's mother. They basically said it's over and the only way to get my mother's body out and Lucy's was to demo the mall. Two bodies were eventually pulled from the rubble. More than a year later, the inquiry will now try to answer a question that still haunts this community, whether the decision to suspend the rescue effort was the right one. Jeff Semple, CBC News, Toronto. Ontario's Advocate for Children and Youth issued a report today chronicling persistent problems at the country's biggest jail for young offenders. Ron Charles has the story. The philosophy of this place is ambitious to say the least. Incarcerate young people charged or convicted of serious crimes while offering them all education, rehabilitation, empathetic staff and lots of personal growth activities. I think they're at a tipping point where we can move towards that, that promise or drift from it. With on average 75 youth in custody at any one time, the McMurtry Centre is Canada's largest youth jail. The Advocate's report is based on interviews with the youth, as well as almost 200 phone-in complaints from them. A big concern, allegations of assault. And it's not all staff. I'm not saying that happens to every young person, but at least half of the young per people had said they witnessed or experienced uh, some, some excessive use of force at one point or another. And he so says that's a far cry from the center's philosophy of relationship custody, where staff work closely with youth to de-escalate potentially violent incidents. It's a close custody facility. That's but reality. community worker Andrew Backus says he has seen relationship custody work inside the center. So I've certainly seen interaction, positive interaction with kids and staff. I see it all the time. The minister responsible for the center says she is looking at the advocate's recommendations. Uh, can improvements be made? Improvements can always be made in any of these centers and we'll continue to work with the advocates and work with our agencies to move to that end. The advocate says he's been dealing with the same kinds of complaints from young people since 2009 when the Roy McMurtry Youth Center first opened. Ron Charles, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. Perhaps you can't fathom leaving Fluffy or Fido at home when you get on a plane, but for fellow airline passengers with allergies, a pet under the seat next to them may pose a serious health risk. Aaron Saltzman reports on a new rule that has pet owners talking. At four months old, Quincy is about to take her first flight and she'll be right next to her owner the entire way. I wouldn't bring her if she had to go underneath the airplane in the carriage. I, I wouldn't bring her uh, on the trip with us. But Quincy could be grounded, at least temporarily, under new regulations announced this month. The rules come from the Canadian Transportation Agency, which received a complaint from a woman flying on Air Canada. She's an asthmatic who also suffered a severe allergic reaction when she was seated behind a passenger with a dog. Marley Greenglass did not want to appear on camera, but she spoke with CBC News on the phone about her experience. I was like wheezing and I couldn't breathe and I was, you know, covered in my mask and I think I must have taken five or six Ventolin so I was shaking already. This respirologist says situations like that are potentially life-threatening. It could be very serious. They could develop a hole in their lungs um, that could collapse their lungs due to the pressure changes and that can even be fatal in some circumstances. The Canadian Transportation Agency agrees. It says someone with a severe dog allergy should be considered a person with a disability. It says dogs should be kept at least five rows away from them. 
And it says if an allergy sufferer is flying on an aircraft without a HEPA air filtration system, the agency says dogs should be bumped to the next flight. The ruling only applies to Air Canada, but WestJet also says it plans to comply voluntarily. It is a polarizing issue for passengers. If they're just going to let people sit at the back, that might not be good enough. Planes are for people, and uh, if you want to transport your pet, transport it down in a container below. The woman whose complaint started all this says the new rules will allow both her and pets to fly on the same plane. The regulations are supposed to take effect next month. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. The British Medical Journal says there's now evidence Chinese bird flu has been spread between people. Previously, cases were limited to people exposed to live poultry that carried the virus. The study says a woman who died of the virus had no known contact with live poultry. It's believed she may have caught the H7N9 virus from her father. He regularly visited live poultry markets. Still, some experts say there's no evidence the virus has developed the ability to spread easily between humans. This new version of bird flu has infected 133 people in China and Taiwan so far. 43 people have died. Let's take a look at the day's market numbers. The TSX lost 56 points to 12,412. The Dow Jones dropped 48 points to 15,470. And the Nasdaq fell roughly 12 points to 3,654. The Canadian dollar closed at 95.94 cents US, down four tenths. Gold was up $2.80 to $1,285 an ounce. And oil slipped 93 cents to $104.37 per barrel.
Well, due to bad weather conditions last night, Border Cats and Little League were canceled. Looking like that's not going to be a problem tonight. I'm keeping my fingers crossed uh, and we'll hopefully have the final results for everyone on both those games. Actually, there's three games. There's a doubleheader yeah, yeah. going on at Port Arthur Stadium on the late edition. We've got a battle going on for first place as Round Robin play continues tonight at 6.30. So they're now underway. It's the Thunder Bay Selects facing unbeaten Cape Breton. And the winner at Baseball Central will play in the one versus four game tomorrow with the Canadian Senior Little League Tournament. Your Border Cats in the meantime, they were rained out last night. They'll play a pair of seven inning games at Port Arthur Stadium against Eau Claire. The first one is now underway. In the majors, the Jays gunning for a fourth straight win in Seattle this afternoon. Jay Happ on the mound for the first time in three months. Mariners get to him in the first. Nick Franklin triples past Jose Bautista in right. That drives in Brad Miller in the second. The Jays solve Aaron Harang. Canada's Brett Laurie slaps a single to right. That'll do the job. Sending in Edwin Encardacion. It's 2-1. Light hitting Josh Tolley picks up his biggest hit of the year. Nailing a ground rule double to the left, Adam Lind and Laurie cross the plate. Jays take their first lead. It's a five-run inning for the visitors as Emilio Bonifacio lays down a beautiful bunt down the third baseline. Totally lumbers home. That would make it 5-2 Blue Jays. They chase her rank from the game in the third. Encarnacion swats his 30th homer. If you like that, you'll love this. Adam Lynn goes deep for the 14th time. Toronto led at 7-2. But uh, the roof has sort of caved in on the Jays. They now trail Seattle. It's 9-7 in the sixth inning. Well, we all know about Patrick Sharp and his accomplishments with the Chicago Blackhawks, but there's a long list of local players with ties to that NHL franchise. In fact, 28 regional hockey players have worn a Hawks jersey dating back to Tommy Cook and Roger Jenkins, who were members of Chicago's first Stanley Cup winning club back in 1934. Today, the Northwestern Ontario Sports Hall of Fame honored that rich history. Mayor Keith Hobbs, of course, is a well-known Boston Bruins fan. He helped raise the Chicago Blackhawks flag outside the May Street facility this afternoon alongside former Hawks player Steve Hermnick, who played for the club during the 1951-52 season. Hobbs, who promptly removed the autograph, Patrick Sharp jersey after the ceremony says even though Sharp and company robbed his Bruins of a seventh cup win earlier this year, he's proud that so many Thunder Bay players and coaches played a role in capturing the greatest trophy in pro sports. If any team, uh, Chicago Blackhawks would be the team to lose to the original six. And we have our own Patrick Sharp, Carter Hutton, Norm McIver, Jamie Compon in the management. Uh, we met a former player from 51-52 here. Uh, today and uh, they're a great hockey team, great organization. It's a neat tradition actually we're starting, not just for uh, National Hockey League teams. What we're hoping is teams and athletes from Northwest Ontario who win national or provincial championships or international awards, we encourage them to contact us and we would love to fly their flag here uh, for a month at the, at the Hall of Fame. They provide the flag, we'll fly it. The flag will fly outside the Hall of Fame until the end of August. At the Ivan Halinka Under-18 Hockey Tournament in the Czech Republic, Canada needed a shootout to slip by Switzerland 4-3 today. Braden Point had the game winner. Fort Francis beat out Dryden in the Craft Celebration Tour, collecting over 5,000, make that 500,000 votes in a 24-hour span. That's a lot of voting. Curling Club President Ron Silver says the result is the third highest total TSN has seen in the five-year history of the contest. TSM will be airing a live broadcast of Sports Center from Fort Francis at the Marina on August 25th. As part of their victory, $25,000 will go to the Curling Club's new geothermal heating and cooling unit, a piece of equipment that set them back more than a half million dollars. Silver says the amount of support for the club blew them away. The momentum that's been building in town has just been absolutely amazing. Our organizing committee and everybody involved with it has just stepped forward and they're so excited about about this event, um, really outstanding how the way the whole community pulled itself together and people from across the world actually were having votes from all over the place uh, coming in. It's just absolutely amazing the way the people actually came together and uh, made this thing happen for us. Silver hopes the exposure for the club will help boost membership, showing people that the curling rink is a fun place to be in the wintertime alongside family and friends. Golfers continue to prepare for the PGA Championship in Rochester, New York tomorrow. Rory McIlroy won it last year. Nobody, though, is hotter than uh, new British Open champ Phil Mickelson, who has won two of his last three tournaments. But you don't want to discount Tiger Woods. He's won five events this year and will be after his 15th career major. The longest spell that I've had since I hadn't 
hadn't won in a major championship. You know, I came out here <laughs> very early and won my first one uh, in, back in 97. So um, I've had uh, certainly my, my share of, of chances to win. As, you know, I've had my opportunities there on, on the back nine on, on those, probably about half, half of those Sundays in the last five years where I've had a chance and um, just haven't, uh, haven't won it. But the key is to keep giving myself chances. Um, you know, eventually that, you know, I'll start getting them. Having them win in one major championship just automatically means you had a great year. Um, even if you, I think you missed a cut in every tournament you play in, you win one, um, you're part of history. Uh, this year for me, I think it's been a, been, a, been a great year so far for me. Winning, you know, five times and look at the quality of events that I've won, you know, a players and two World Golf Championships in there. Um, that's, that's pretty good. Two-time Rogers Cup champ Andy Murray along with Candace Vasek Pospisil have advanced to round three of the Rogers Cup in Montreal. Last night, 11 seed Milos Raonic of Thornhill, Ontario utilized his raw power to get by Jeremy Charty of France in three sets, 6-3, 4-6, 7-5. Vancouver's Philip Pelawo moves on thanks to an injury to his opponent, Yarko Niemannen, in the third set, so he would pull out of it. Niagara Falls native Frank Dancevich earned his first win this year, and Pospisil would upset 20th-ranked American John Isner. So it's the first time five Canadians have made it this far since 1972. Defending champ and world number one Novak Djokovic cruised through uh, with a straight sets victory. Meantime, in uh, well, that's Novak Djokovic there. Look at that! What a way to celebrate. In Toronto at the Women's Rogers Cup, Quebec's Eugenie Bouchard dominated Russian Alice Klibanova in straight sets. The 19-year-old will face defending champ Petra Kivitova next. In a battle of Canucks, Toronto's Sharon Fitchman knocked off Stephanie Dubois. That's a big upset in three sets. And week six in the CFL resumes tomorrow night in Montreal with the Alouettes hosting Toronto. The BC Lions are enjoying their bye week after beating Winnipeg by only seven points. So there's plenty of things to improve on for the Leos. A tough, tough battle like this, and there's so many things that you have to adjust on the fly. A physical game, guys got to make plays. You deal with adversity, whether it's sudden change, whether it's a lack of an operation in a critical situation. You take a lot out of that, and then you can go back and learn from it. But, you know, the guys in there, they're just so exhausted. And you sense that because emotionally, physically, they gave it everything they had. And you could see both the defensive line and offensive line were stellar. They really, really were. I mean, you, you could look at it, you could see it from the sideline, and you're going to point out, well, there was not enough sacks, there was some sacks. But overall, those two our line of scrimmage played very, very well. Oh, it was tough. Winnipeg came in ready to play. Um, I felt like we left uh, a couple plays out there defensively, but overall, we got the W. We uh, put the game together with some adversity. Um, you know, it, it, it's a weekend. It's a work in progress, rather. And the, the, the goal is in the 18-game season is to get better each week. The Grey Cup isn't one right now. So we still been. We got a long ways to go, but we're happy with being 4-2 and two going into the bye. The Thunder Bay Lakers 10 and under baseball team went 4 and 1, capturing the consolation crown at a tournament in Duluth. Now, the plays of the week. Three, two, one, and exit. All right, hits it in the hole. Anders has a jump throw to first, and they got it. Sensational play by Elvis Anders at shortstop. Big lead off the bag. He goes, and the 3 2, a swing and a fly ball, left center field. Hit well, came back at the wall, leaps up, and came. Chunky, isn't it? Believe me, it sounded just like it was meant to sound. Oh, come on. Hey, all that working out, you can't open a water bottle? You know, it is a lot harder than it looks. To open a water bottle? I've struggled before. <laughs> I've struggled. I keep going the wrong way. <laughs> well, you can get your Big Brother fix tonight on Global Thunder Bay. With more, here's Teletalk. Tonight on Global Thunder Bay, the heat is on as tempers flare and love is in the air. Starting at 8 on Big Brother, it's time for some players to make their move in the household. Then at 9, it's glee and the tension between Will and Finn bubbles over into their weekly assignment. And at 10 on camp, everyone's trying to keep cool as the heat wave descends on Camp Little Otter. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay, it's a night of major deals and major mysteries. 
first at eight. We hear the largest ask ever, and a prairie product creates buzz on Dragon's Den. And at nine on Republic of Doyle, Jake is hot on the trail of an international art thief. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists. We had a risk of rain throughout the day today, but uh, luckily, Sarah, that didn't happen today. That's right. Uh, people might be liking me a little bit more than they were <laughs> yesterday. I don't know. Um, we made it up to about 20 degrees today, and those showers did hold off. The uh, possibility of thunderstorm never happened. We made it up to 20 degrees under sun and cloud, and those winds coming from the north, northwest, gusting up to about... Uh, 14 kilometers per hour. Uh, at this hour across the country, British Columbia was a bit cloudy in Prince George throughout the day. Those temperatures are quite seasonal for this time of year. Alberta is looking at some rain showers. Currently uh, 16 in Edmonton under cloudy skies. Cool day today in the prairies. Only 15 degrees right now in Saskatoon. 17 in Regina under cloudy skies as well. Still cloudy once we get to Winnipeg. They didn't even crack 20 today, still sitting at 18 degrees under also still cloudy skies. Much warmer today in southern Ontario. Uh, Toronto sitting at 27 degrees at Humidex has it feeling much warmer. Thunderstorm watches and warnings in effect for most of southern Ontario, including the city of Toronto itself. Ottawa and Montreal, 22 degrees. Under cloudy skies, you wouldn't know it, but that Humidex has it feeling much warmer. Same case in Quebec City, currently sitting at 25 degrees.
As we uh, take a look onto the east coast, Halifax right now sitting at 22 degrees under mainly sunny skies. It's a bit cooler inland, maybe near the Halifax waterfront, but uh, still quite seasonal for this time of year. Fredericton sitting at 23 degrees, a bit of cloud there, same case in Charlottetown. And St. John's is sitting at 12 degrees, which is a bit cooler today, but that is what happens when you're surrounded by water. Uh, today for our area, we can see this cool front that we have been following uh, is bringing a bit of cloud cover, but so far not much precipitation. Same case into early tomorrow, we could get a bit of pop-up uh, shower activity later into Friday, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, across the region overnight tonight, dipping down qu quite cool, going down to about 5 degrees in Red Lake, uh, 7 in areas like Dryden and Atacokan. For tomorrow, heating up, it's still quite cool for this time of year. These aren't the temperatures that people want to be seeing in August. Uh, about 13 degrees expected tomorrow in Pickle Lake. Thunder Bay at this hour, we're currently sitting at 18 degrees. Mostly cloudy skies, so those clouds have come in a little bit in the last couple of hours. Winds coming from the northwest, gusting up to about uh, 10 kilometers per hour. Overnight tonight, dropping down to a low of 7 degrees under clear skies and those winds switching uh, to the north, but still not really much to worry about there. To start your day off tomorrow, partly cloudy in the morning, about 11 degrees by noon, warming up a little bit, still not cracking 20, uh, sun and cloud by noon. And the possibility of those thunder showers, showers that I was mentioning, I think that it, it will probably be short-lived if it does happen by late into the afternoon. For the rest of the week, uh, onto Friday to kick off your weekend, a passing shower, but for the most part, sun and cloud, getting up over the 20 degree mark, Mostly sunny for the weekend on Saturday, 23 degrees expected. Partly sunny, but uh, just a few clouds expected on Sunday to end your weekend with a high of 24 and to start your new week. Seasonal temperatures expected to continue with that high of 23. And that's your weather forecast. Thanks, Sarah. Looks like a beautiful weekend ahead of for us. Okay. Well, some people may be afraid to fly. I am one of those people. But in order to conquer that fear, the guy we're going to show you after the break has a very unique way to do it. Stay with us.
One man is getting some attention for facing his fears. Take a look. This nervous flyer decided to tackle his severe phobia by taking an aerobatics flight with his friend. And he brought a camera along to capture all the screams and terror and exhilaration. The YouTube video has gone viral with more than a quarter million views in just one day. Oh, I love watching that. I can watch that all day long. You were. I, I, yeah. Well, I'm just I'll tell you. <laughs> All right, we're going to recap our top story. Well, the Thunder Bay man who escaped a bear attack on Saturday spoke publicly today about his ordeal. The bear attacked the man and his two dogs several times. One of the dogs died from the attack. And we got a battle for first place at the Canadian Senior Little League Championships. It's the Thunder Bay Selects in Cape Breton. Ryan Bonazzo with highlights later on. And a bit of cloud uh, right now that's expected to clear up overnight and hopefully some uh, sunshine tomorrow as well. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a good night.